What is selective mutism and how can we help in school? That's what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. Let's dive straight in. Imagine being a child trapped in a world where words fail to escape your lips when you most want to express yourself. Selective mutism is not a choice, nor is it defiance. It's a silent struggle, an expression of intense anxiety that robs children of their voices, leaving them isolated and often misunderstood. In this episode of Pookie Ponders, we're going to explore what selective mutism is, who it affects, and most importantly, how we can help these children to find their voices and build their confidence at school. Okay, so now we set the stage a little bit. Let's dive deeper into what the selective mutism really is and who it affects. So selective mutism it is a complex anxiety disorder that profoundly impacts on a child's ability to speak in specific social situations. So this is typically going to be at school or in unfamiliar environments. It's essential essential to recognize that selective mutism is not a choice nor is it a form of defiance it's a manifestation of intense anxiety that leaves children unable rather than unwilling to speak this anxiety induced silence can be misunderstood it leads some people to believe that the child is just being stubborn or choosing not to communicate but it's crucial to dispel this misconception and recognise that selective mutism is a valid and very challenging mental health condition. Mutism is not uncommon and it often occurs in children who already face heightened anxiety levels. It's particularly prevalent amongst the autistic population where social interactions and new environments can trigger overwhelming anxiety, something I experience myself at various points in life. So for these children and adults, selective mutism may manifest as an inability to communicate verbally in some situations, even though they may have the capacity to do so in others. Understanding that selective mutism is rooted in anxiety rather than defiance is the first step towards providing effective support for affected children. By acknowledging the anxiety-driven nature of the condition, parents, educators and other caregivers can take a more compassionate and constructive approach to helping these children to find their voices and build their confidence in social situations. So let's think now a little bit about how we might spot those early warning signs that a child is at risk or is developing some form of mutism. So early identification of selective mutism is really crucial for effective intervention. Understanding the signs and the potential triggers can help parents and educators to provide timely support. Selective mutism is a really complex anxiety disorder and it affects a child's ability to speak in certain situations. Um, it goes beyond just mere shyness and can have a really big impact on children's social and academic development. And the longer that it goes on, the more entrenched it can become and the harder it can be to break the cycle. So early recognition and early intervention really are are going to make a massive difference. So warning signs. Here are 10 warning signs that you might spot. So first of all, consistent silence. A child who consistently refrains from speaking in social settings like the classroom, even when they might feel really comfortable speaking in other environments. Number two, limited vocalization. So a child who may communicate non-verbally or with gestures, nods or whispers, but doesn't tend to use their voice very much. Number three, social anxiety. So a child who exhibits signs of extreme social anxiety. So they might be like avoiding eye contact, hiding behind objects, clinging to a trusted person when they are in social situations. Number four, Avoidance of speaking tasks. So a child might avoid tasks completely that involve speaking. So they might avoid reading aloud in class. They might not put their hand up to answer questions. They might refrain from participating in class discussions, for example. Number five, physical symptoms. So we'll sometimes see anxiety related physical symptoms. So like trembling or sweating or an upset tummy um, that might become present anytime a child is expected to speak. 
Number six is a frozen expression. So facial expressions might remain frozen or really tense when a child is expected to speak in specific situations. Number seven is a difficulty in initiating conversations. So a child who may struggle to initiate or maintain conversations with peers or teachers. Number eight is selective participation. So the child might participate selectively, only engaging in activities where speaking is not required and withdrawing from those that do, or only sort of involving themselves in speaking activities where they feel much more comfortable because of the place or the people or the situation. Number nine is high sensitivity. So there is maybe a child who's going to display heightened sensitivity to things like sensory stimuli, like noise or touch that can contribute to their anxiety. And number 10 is what might look like an unwillingness to communicate their needs. So they might refrain from actually communicating their needs or their preferences verbally, relying on on others to interpret their non-verbal cues. So understanding these warning signs, you may see some of them, you may not see all of them, but understanding these warning signs can help you to identify children who might be in those earlier stages of beginning to struggle with selective mutism or at risk of it. And then we can take appropriate steps to provide support, which is what we're going to think about next. So how do we go about creating a supportive school environment? So fostering a supportive and understanding school environment is going to be really essential for children with selective mutism so that it feels safe for them and they feel encouraged and enabled to communicate in some way. So what can we do? I'm going to share another 10 ideas here for you. Um, And hopefully as you listen, you're going to come up with tons more of your own. There's so many things that we can do here once we understand the beast that we're trying to slay this is is not about a child being defiant this is this is anxiety essentially so how do we enable a child to feel safe to have their voice heard in some way so the first idea is communication cards we can provide a child with a set of communication cards that they can use to express common needs or feelings like asking to go to the toilet or showing that they're hungry or um, showing us that they're overwhelmed so communication cards next is using a visual timetable so creating a visual timetable for the child is going to outline their daily schedule this kind of visual aid is going to help them to anticipate when there may be speaking opportunities that are going to arise that might help to reduce their anxiety or help us to plan with them to get them to a really good place feeling ready to engage in those parts of the day. Idea three is about non-verbal participation. So encouraging non-verbal forms of participation so the child can still have their voice heard but in different ways. So they might, instead of speaking, have their voice heard through their drawings, through their writing or using gestures during classroom activities and discussions. I find mini whiteboards to be an incredibly helpful tool here for drawing, writing, really enabling a child to engage. Number four is peer-to-peer role models. So pairing the child with a supportive peer who can serve as a role model for verbal communication and who can also model appropriate social interactions, offer reassurance, and sometimes act as a bit of an ally or an advocate for a child who may be quieter. Number five is uh, sensory support. So designating a sensory-friendly corner in the classroom with tools like stress balls, fidget toys or noise cancelling headphones so that the child can use these things when they're feeling overwhelmed because remember there's that link between feeling overwhelmed, very anxious and then finding that we can't talk. So having the ability to emotionally regulate, having a safe space we can go to to do that and get the sensory input that we might need in order to enable that to happen is going to increase the likelihood of the child being able to engage in other activities later on. Idea number six is small group activities. So incorporating small group activities into the curriculum with familiar groups so that the child can interact with just a few classmates at a time rather than the whole class. So that's going to reduce the pressure of speaking in front of a large group. And if we get the place right and the faces right, this is going to just slowly begin to build that child's confidence so that they don't completely let go of speaking or that they can begin to explore perhaps doing that again in an environment 
feels just a bit more manageable to them. Idea seven is around gradual exposure. So if they've got one, working with a child's speech therapist to create a gradual exposure plan. Um, and what we're doing with a gradual exposure plan is we're starting with really low pressure speaking tasks and then progressively increasing the complexity as the child becomes more comfortable. So what you're often going to find is at the beginning that a child might only have like one person they feel safe speaking to or in front of in school. That might be um, a learning support assistant. It might be a friend. But we might gradually be kind of increasing that circle of trust in the environments in which they want to speak. Don't push this too fast or too hard. Celebrate every tiny little step along the way. And as I say, if there is a speech therapist involved, they are worth their weight in gold and have them guide you along this pathway. Idea number eight is using visual support. So using visual supports like social stories or visual cues to prepare the child for specific speaking situations such as show and tell or presentations. Idea number nine is encouraging written responses. So allowing the child to provide written responses to questions or assignments as an alternative to verbal answers. And again, your mini whiteboard will work wonders here. Um, and then idea number 10 is positive reinforcement. So when we come back to a lot of the time. So implementing some kind of reward system, even if that's just a verbal nod and a smile, but it's going to acknowledge and celebrate the child's communication efforts, no matter how tiny. Every, every, every tiny little thing here does need to be acknowledged, noticed, smiled about, celebrated, um, so that we can boost that child's confidence and motivation to speak. Be careful, though, about when this happens. Do not make a big song and a dance about the fact that they've just spoken in front of everyone because this can really drive that social anxiety. You don't want to draw big attention to the child, but instead do our quiet praise. So notice quietly later or just catch their eye across the classroom and give them a nod or a smile. I saw that. That's epic. But yeah, don't make a big thing about it. When we draw attention to the situation, that is likely going to make them mute much more quickly than anything else that we could ever do. So praise, reward, recognition, all fantastic. However, in the right moments, not in high pressure moments. So when we incorporate these kind of practical ideas into the classroom, then we're going to be creating this supportive and inclusive environment, which is going to empower our children to participate and communicate at their own pace. And that's really crucial because we've got to remember this is an anxiety driven disorder. So we need to make things feel safe. The child needs to feel supported and not hurried. Hurrying them towards speaking is the quickest way to make them very quiet. OK, next, we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about effective communication strategies. So educators and indeed people at home, if you're listening as a parent or carer, can employ various communication strategies to help selectively mute children to feel a bit more comfortable speaking in class. So even better if this can be done in conjunction with their speech and language therapist, if they have one. Again, worth their weight in gold. Please grab onto them and have them help you on this journey. Um, they can be like really instrumental in helping our selectively mute children overcome their challenges through like gradual exposure and desensitization but the ideas I'm going to share here are ones that you could do without the therapist if you don't have access to one or if you don't have access as often as you'd like or you're on a waiting list or, or what have you um, but yeah ideally you would do them alongside them so the ideas are going to build on this foundation of the ideas we just talked about about creating that supportive school environment but these are more specific in terms of communication strategies that can be implemented in the classroom to encourage encourage selectively mute children to begin to communicate effectively as part of the class. So first of all, we can have like gradual exposure conversations. So if we can, working with a child's speech therapist to create structured, gradual exposure conversations. This is going to start with like really simple, non-threatening topics. The thing that the child would want to talk about more than anything else in the world in a space that feels safe with a face that feels safe and then gradually progressing to more complex discussions until the child becomes a little bit more comfortable this this is a journey this is going to take time but we start really tiny with a step so small that we feel that we can't fail idea number two is having communication partners so actually assigning a specific partner to the child this might be a teacher it might be a teaching assistant it might be a peer somebody who the child feels more comfortable 
comfortable with. Um, and then in any kind of partnered activities that you might be doing in class, having a consistent partner is going to reduce that anxiety when it comes to communication. So even if everyone else is switching around, if this child feels more comfortable with the same person all the time, then we roll with that. Idea number three is around visual communication tools. So introducing visual communication tools like a communication passport that might contain essential information about the child's preferences, interests and communication strategies that can help to bridge gaps in understanding if the child can't advocate for themselves with their words. Remembering that this is an anxiety driven disorder, the less well the child's needs are met, the less safe they're going to feel, the less they're going to be likely to be able to speak. So we've got to think about how to communicate their needs so they need can be met when they can't speak or else this cycle can be like very very negative um, and quite quickly so we need to find ways to prevent and circumnavigate that next is sensory friendly communication so creating a sensory friendly communication space where the child can communicate more comfortably in whatever way communication can take many forms so this might be like a quiet corner with soft lighting and sensory tools to reduce that sensory overload just think what will feel safe and inviting and provoke sensory joy for this child creating that environment that feels good where they feel happy where they feel calm where they feel connected is going to be one where they feel more able to communicate um, and then the final thought here is around collaborative goal setting so involving the child in setting their communication goals we are asking them to do a really hard Thing. So it's really important that this is something that they actually want and that we're driving towards goals that feel realistic to them, that they are motivated by and that they're driven to succeed with. So this is also going to enable them to like take ownership of their progress and it's going to help us to tailor our strategies to their specific wants and needs. So this collaboration between child, family and school is absolutely crucial but the child must sit right at the heart of this. They're the ones doing the really hard work so we've got to make sure these goals make sense to them and that they feel like they are achievable. Okay and then the final thing we're going to think about today is parent school collaboration. This is absolutely crucial because collaborative efforts between parents and schools are going to be vital for the well-being and development of our children with selective mutism. We're going to build on that supportive school environment and effective communication strategies by working well between home and school. Parents and carers have a huge amount to offer here. We will often find that a child is mute at school but speaks at home or sometimes vice versa. We've got lots and lots to learn from one another here. This is a situation where we must be that team around the child, providing consistent, safe support to try and promote the ability to communicate for the child. So how are we going to make that work? We can think about having shared communication plans. So developing shared communication communication plans that outline how both parents and school can support the child's communication goals consistently. The plan's going to need to include strategies that are working well for the child. So you might learn about what's working well at school and apply that to home or vice versa. Um, and we're going to think about how to co-produce that with the child as well. Going back to that idea that they're the ones having to do the really hard work. We've got to make sure that our plans are driven by their wants, their desires, by what feels potentially possible for them. The next thing when it comes to like homeschool is thinking about progress tracking. So implementing like some kind of shared progress tracking system that allows both parents and carers and educators to monitor the child's communication and celebrate achievements together. We need to notice progress no matter how small and celebrate that in appropriate ways and in an appropriate time so that we can all see that progress. It's good for us too. It's really encouraging for us, but also so that our child can feel that love, that joy, that encouragement when they're able to make small steps forward. The next thing between like working between home and school is trying, if we can, to create some consistency across the environment. So ensuring that consistency between home and school environments in terms of communication strategies and expectations is going to really support the child. It makes things feel more predictable, which makes them feel safer, which helps to uh, enable that communication. Remembering it all comes down to feeling anxious. So we need to Take that, reverse it, make them feel safe. Consistency between home and school is going to really, really help with that. Regular communication between parents and teachers is obviously going to be absolutely crucial in terms of achieving this. 
The next thing we can do is think about like joint celebration. So actually celebrating communication successes as a joint effort. We're in this together. Home, school, child, we are in this together. Let's create opportunities for the child to showcase their communication skills perhaps um, in a way that doesn't feel too pressured. Um, but that might be like as their um, abilities and their confidence begins to build, like sometime maybe we can work towards them like doing presentations, performances or using other creative activities to begin to express how things are going for them. Um, and then finally, just thinking about mutual learning between home and school. So we might facilitate mutual learning by encouraging parents and carers to share their insights about the child's selective mutism with teachers and vice versa. We've got so, so much to learn from each other here. So this exchange of knowledge is going to lead to much more effective strategies and support. Work together, guys. It really is much, much more effective this way. It can get like us and them. No one is the enemy here. We are allies and we're all on the team of the child. These ideas are going to help to strengthen the collaboration between parents and schools, ensuring the child's needs related to their selective mutism are going to be consistently addressed both at home and at school. A key thing to remember, as I've said like 8,000 times, is we're all on the same team and that team must always have the child at its heart. So there you have it. Another journey through the world of child's mental health and well-being today, shedding some light, I hope, on this very often misunderstood condition of selective mutism and providing what I hope you will find to be valuable insights and practical strategies you can put into place right away. So remember, remember, selective mutism is it's not a choice. It's a challenge that's rooted in anxiety. And by recognizing this and offering support, we can help these children to find their voices and to thrive in school. I really hope there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you liked what you heard today, please like, subscribe and share my work. You can support my work further, should you wish to, by joining me over on Patreon, where you get early access to my resources and a chance to influence what I work on next. Or... Or you can invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you are doing for the children and young people in your care. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over and out. Mm -hmm.